In the previous video, we analyzed our target binary for a bit and found the main dispatcher of network functions. And this is actually the most interesting part, to examine function which actually deal with our payload. So let's continue where we left off. And in the meantime, don't forget to check out our today's sponsor, me. I provide consultations regarding everything about hacking, reverse engineering and efficient security career. So don't forget to check out the link in the description, sit back, relax, grab yourself a cup of tea and let's get started. And here we can see how the first byte sent via network by user is used. So this first byte is uh, compared against some uh, hard-coded values. Right now we don't know exact meaning behind that, so we can skip this bit of code and return to it later. And what is really interesting is uh, this switch. It decides what action will be taken based of a value of first byte. Uh, it seems to me that the first byte performs a role of uh, some sort of uh, function code and then this switch decides what function will actually dispatch our request. And this is the pattern you're gonna see a lot if you'll be doing network protocol reverse engineering. First receive a header which will contain a length of the following bytes. Then take some bytes from the packet and use them as some sort of a function code. So let's start to dig through those functions. Let me start from uh, function free. First let me convert our argument to pointer to our stack one. And then let's get straight into the first function, which is kind of a wrap around another function, which in its case does some real work. So I think I should uh, convert this argument again to point to our stack one. At the line eight, we can see that the function performs sanity check. It wants to make sure that it won't perform a read outside of the target buffer. And after that, we can see an already familiar pattern. The function copies two bytes from the packet buffer using pointer inside packet field, and then it converts byte order and saves the result to the variable pointed by A2. And once again, we can see that pointer inside packets get incremented by two. So I think we can rename our function to something like get uh, two bytes from packet and this function is going to be renamed to get two bytes from packet wrapper. So now we understand that the first two bytes of the packet payload are stored into variable v5. I can rename it to something like first two bytes. And then we can see that the first two bytes are being checked against the socket handle, which is stored inside uh, our structure. And we want to satisfy this check if uh, we want to get access to all the function functionality. It makes sense to assume that the socket handle should be communicated to the client prior to using this function. So probably we want to dig deeper into some other function of this protocol to find out where it happens. But for now, let's continue with reverse engineering this function. So let's take a look at the next function which is being called. For now, we don't know exactly what the purpose of CRC variable and V3 variable, but we know that this function takes pointer to our stack 1 as the first argument and some uh, hard-coded number 64, in our case, uh, as the last argument. So let me do our usual, convert to struct pointer, and I can rename argument A4 to number 64 for now. Here we can see that uh, some another function is being called, so let's go in here. Uh, let's again convert pointer type and it's the first time we can see this pattern. So I think 
We all already know the purpose of this function. Get four bytes from packet. And here I can re rename v6 to four bytes from packet. And again we can see some sanity checks being performed here and it makes me assume that uh, both four number from packet A3 and number 64 correspond to a length of uh, something. And if the 4 byte integer we got from the packet is bigger than 64, the number 64 will be used as our length. So I can rename our argument 3 as len out final length which is being used is stored into this variable. And then we can see that our function copies len out number of bytes from our packet to variable a2 and then increments uh, our pointer inside packets by number of bytes which was copied. So this format is commonly used in transferring strings or binary blobs of data via network. At first client sends the length of the following data and then the data itself. So the server knows the correct length of data. Let me rename our function to get blob from packet. And right now it is clear that src is some kind of binary array of data and v3 is binary array len. So let's get into the next function. So this variable can be renamed to binary array. I'll rename pmem to some kind of new structure which is clearly is being created here. A3 is our binary array length. Here we can see that our new structure initialization is taking place and some additional initialization is performed inside this function. Let's leave it here for now and create another C structure for our new structure. Let me go again in structure step create new structure. I'm going to name it struct function free. Okay, so what about the size of our structure? We can see that this function tries to allocate uh, 54 bytes in hex. So uh, let me again do our trick with uh, array and do an array of 54 elements. Let me check those checkboxes and you can see that we created a structure which is exactly 54 hex bytes in size. So let's convert new structure to pointer to our new structure and here we can start to rename our fields. So I can rename field, C, field 6 to binary array from packet field 46 to binary array len I can rename field 0 to pointer to field teen in struct 1 and I can give some kinds of placeholder names to the rest of the fields. So this will be num1, this will be num minus 1, 1, and this will be num minus 1, 2. Okay, let's go into this structure and convert this variable to point to our new structure and here we can see that some heap buffer of the size of 8 bytes is being allocated and we can name 
this field to pointer to buffer of 8 bytes. Okay, let's go back. So here we can rename field 18 to function free object. And to make the video a bit shorter, I'm gonna skip reverse engineering these functions because they are not really relevant to what we are trying to do. So let's go back. Now I can rename this to function free. So we can distinct this function we already have reverse engineered from uh, other function which with after generated names. And I want you to take a look at line 49. Previously we saw here an ambiguous check of an unknown structure field. But now we can see that this check is being performed against function tree object, which is obviously created in function free we have just reverse engineered. And this is a really important part of a reverse engineering flow. When you're beginning reverse engineering of a binary, there are a lot of blind spots on your map and you have to skip some of the unknown bits and move on to return to them later, just as we did. And this kind of spiral motion is one of the defining characteristics of reverse engineering. We can see here that the binary decides which logic will be executed based on whether or not function free object is initialized. And as I am basically cheating, as I reverse engineered this binary earlier, I know that in the case when our object tree is initialized and we are calling function 2, we can get only an error message. And the interesting logic resides inside this function. Let me do our usual and convert a1 to pointer to our stack 1. So here we can see quite a lot going on. Let me reverse engineer it through the power of video editing. So now we can see that this function retrieves a number of fields from the packet and then based on those fields it uh, creates uh, some kind of connection structure. So to use this function we need to provide those five fields in our packet. After creating connection structure, this function does something interesting. It copies socket handle to our response packet. And this is where the connection algorithm of this protocol becomes clear to us. At first we need to use function number 2 to create connection object in function open connection. And then we are free to use this connection structure with uh, any of these functions. So let's write a proof of concept client for this protocol using these two functions. So I wrote a little script in Python with class connection, which encapsulates logic we need to connect to the server and use function number three. Let's take a look at how my code corresponds with code we've reverse engineered earlier. Let me open this function and we know that this function reads five fields from the packet. And the first field is double word, which is read by function get for bytes from packet. And we can see that in my script I'm also adding some kind of placeholder double word to the packet. Then there goes four strings. And we remember that at first we should put the length of the string to the packet and then we can add the actual string contents to the packet. And after this buffer is formed, it's sent to the server. And one more thing we should pay attention to, and it's this line. We can see that socket handle is being copied to the response buffer. I've called this socket cookie and we are going to need it later in our request to func3. Let's take a look at func3. This function is even simpler than the connection function. 
obviously the first or the opcut byte should be byte free, which corresponds to this place in the code. Then we should put to our buffer the socket cookie, which is later will be read with this function, and after that some string. And just like that, the buffer is sent to the server. Let's run the script and see what response the server will send us. So we can see our client sending request and the server is responding with some blob of data. Of course we don't know its exact format, but judging by the strings we can guess that it might be some kind of database table. So we started it so we started in previous video nothing about network protocol the server uses to communicate. And now we are able to establish the connection and make server to send us some data back, which is a huge first step if you want to reverse engineer a server or to look for some bugs. So this was network protocol reverse engineering. The approach I demonstrated in those videos is not ideal because I focused heavily on static analysis for the sake of the videos. Tell me what I should have done better in the comments below. If you are interested in hacking and reverse engineering, you can join my Discord or Telegram communities via link in the description below. Share this video if you found it helpful. Like and subscribe, and as always, happy hacking you guys! What you think, what you think about When you're born into a fire